Hello and welcome to the channel and uh, it's a new episode, a new place. Look at my background, what a beautiful setting this is at Bonorong Wildlife Sanctuary in Tasmania, very close to Hobart. The first section of the video is more of a highlighted uh, video of our tour and uh, you'll be able to see all these extraordinary animals. Particularly very scary, a tiger snake which was climbing up and also moving around Tasmanian devils. Beautiful gentle movement of echidnas and a dancing kangaroo. But if you're really interested to learn about these extraordinary animals and species like Tasmanian devil or echidna, the Australian native echidna, please watch this video until the end because I have recorded the full narration of our guide and she was explaining all aspects of these animals' life, how they live, how they breed and what kind of food they like and eat. So please watch this video until the end. Look at this Tasmanian landscape. What a beautiful setup. We came to Bonorong Wildlife Sanctuary in near Hobart and uh, enjoy the encounter with Wombat. It's going to be a fascinating storytelling. So she's a bear-nosed Wombat. Mum killed on the road, which unfortunately is a little bit common for Wombats in Tasmania. Now she is about 10 months of age and she weighs about 8 kilos. They can get up to about 40 kilos. They kind of average about 20 kilos though, so but wombats can be very, very large. Oh. You're going to come out? Come on. She goes, don't tip me out. <laughs> She'll probably go straight back to bed because it's all a bit frightening at the moment. So that is looking at the rear end of a wombat and that's cube shaped poo. That one's, that one's my left, so that one's Phoenix, that one is Callie. Good question. So they are both four years of age. They don't look like they're the same age, do they? Because Phoenix is a lot smaller than, than Callie. And the only reason why Phoenix is smaller is her mum was killed on the road when she was very tiny. We had to hand raise her. Used a, an amazing artificial product, but it's not as good as mum's milk. Callie, on my, that side, um, her mum had a horrible disease called devil facial tumour disease. Um, so, devil facial tumour disease, horrible disease, we've lost 68% of devils to it since it was first discovered in 1996. There is no cure, there is no vaccine. And it's transferred, which is this, it's a cancer that is transferable. Um, it's through contact with like blood and saliva. Um, good news is though, they were down to 10,000. Numbers are increasing. So the Save the Tasmania Devil Program, they've been working their way around Tasmania. Guys, get ready for the Echidna Show. It is a fascinating animal that's basically native to Australia and we also have this in Bonorong Wildlife Sanctuary and it's going to be extraordinary because their movement, it's fascinating. The last time we saw Luigi was three weeks ago. So now he's coming out. Now if you guys are lucky enough to see their tongues from where you are, those tongues are 15 centimetres, so six inches long, and they go in and out a hundred times a minute. What he's eating is a delicious concoction of ant stew. So they literally eat ants, and termites, and whams, and grubs. A company makes a product, we just mix it with water, and we give it to the keepers, and they just love it. Look at my background. This is extraordinary echidnas. They're walking towards us. They're basically walking around and how wonderful they look and the movement is just fantastic. What a fantastic creature. Almost interacting with us.
in conservation or in confinement like this one, they can live up to 50 years, that we have been told. So with a good life, they can live very long, almost like humans. Look at my background, there is a wild bandicoot. It's a very small creature and uh, normally they're not very socializing animal. But this one has got trained and it's really socializing with all these people here and posing for the camera. So here, just give us some space, but you're more than welcome to take photos of her. Pretty cool, isn't it? So many people I've met though they they've seen them scurrying past and they've gone, oh, it's a big rat. But it, yeah, they're fantastic little animals because they like to eat fungus and bugs, so they're constantly digging, so they're constantly aerating the soil, and also they're scat. So when they do their poo, the fungus and things like that, the spores spread across the forest road. But that one's a bit cheeky. They're meant to be nocturnal too. So putting on a show. <laughs> that was good spotting. Yeah. We might have to give her a name. <laughs> now we came to see a couple of kookaburras. They're just sitting there quietly. So we'll photograph them. Look at the kookaburras. They're just sitting quietly. I'm sure definitely they're looking at us. This is probably the first time we have been privileged to see some kookaburras. Fantastic, isn't it? They're just sitting there quietly, measuring. Beautiful looking bird. We always relate kookaburra with white cricket dews for while we're playing cricket. And these are the Australian birds, native to Australia. How majestic they are. I got to see the kookaburras from this side. And there, look at that, they're so close. They're just looking at me, looking at the sceneries, thinking what this guy is doing here. From the Kukavura, we came this side. It's just a corner. Look at the beautiful scenery at Bonorong Wildlife Sanctuary. And look at this corner. It's an extra special one because it's full of kangaroos. We just learned that a group of kangaroos are called a mob. So this is a mob of kangaroos. They're all sleeping together. Look at them. What a spectacular view in Tasmania. Beautiful scenarios in the background and they're having a nap. Extraordinary. We never seen so many kangaroos so close all together. There were a lot of kangaroos in Wirrabee in Open Range Zoo that we visited last year. You guys must have seen our video, which is a very popular one on our channel. And this one, extra special in Tasmania. And just extraordinary, so many kangaroos we get to see here all together. Look at this kangaroo waking up, checking if there is any predator. No, it's safe, go back to sleep. And same for this one, this guy. Just checking time to time while others are sleeping. Now we came to see some of these lorikeet. This is the kind of a parrot and they look stunning, very colorful. What a colorful creature. These are so beautiful. They're called mask lorikeet and they're just fascinating. It's written here the, the maskies are nomadic birds that move from region to region with seasonal nectar and blossoms. They build their home within the hollows of eucalyptus trees, so that's very native to Australia as well. But as old eucalyptus with suitable hollows disappear, the lorikeet may find life difficult. a cage for these creatures called twiny frog mouth yeah there is one it's sleeping twiny frog mouth beautiful it's written that its large beak makes it look quite ferocious but in fact the frog mouth is quite a gentle creature okay so that's they look very ferocious of course but they're very gentle they look very similar to the kookaburras but slightly grayish at least the sleeping posture is very similar. It's a beautiful sight. Uh, in this open area, we came to see some spotted tail coal. And uh, hopefully they will be very interesting if we can spot one. Just spotted some spotted tail coal. 
they're sleeping and I had to zoom in through the cage but they're looking extraordinary they're really nicely spotted spotted tailed quolls look like this and that one is sleeping and it's written here they have baby face obviously they're cute but they're assassins they're actually a very good hunter and they can actually kill others in fact their closest living relative to the Tasmanian devils look guys this is blue tongue lizard this is one of the fascinating species that you must be able to see here in Bonorong sanctuary and uh, here it is if I zoom in obviously it's sleeping resting looks like a snake but actually it's a lizard look at this house of this lizard beautifully decorated and small but nice environment created for this creature to flourish and have a healthy life this beautiful pink creatures called gala they're very intelligent they were basically socializing with me it's a big sanctuary of different birds there are some black cockatoo and these little pink creatures just posing for the photos not moving and looking straight and very smart birds are very smart beautiful isn't it such a beauty extraordinary wow <laughs> it came to me and uh, it might uh, have a conversation hello good morning good afternoon hello good afternoon can you talk it's actually following me thank you for the photo pose a yellow-tailed black cockatoo they're quite big and yeah they're pretty big and they're very well trained very intelligent participating in the video gorgeous looking bird doing a lot of activities trying to break the cage probably looking for freedom so it's a beautiful spot and it's a natural environment where they conserve all these animals and we're loving it this particular section is for famous tiger snake Tasmanian tiger snakes this is probably one of the very few most venomous snakes in the world and uh, I think they are in the top five and I don't know whether we can get to see one of these here today but let's try I, I was walking around I came this side and I was started to shake because there is a tiger snake here just where my finger is look at the tiger snake what a body what a muscle it's one of the most venomous snake in the world and roaming around in this bush these are the tiger snakes Ooh, what a creature that is this is the first time I have been seeing a tiger snake alive look how the how they're moving around very strong what a beautiful infrastructure what a beautiful place to visit and look at these birds native birds and there is a kangaroo roaming around this kangaroo is basically very gentle and staying with me and not running around posing for the photo fantastic it's a beautiful encounter it's just posing and very gentle now it has started running look at this kangaroo in my background how gentle that is and uh, socializing with all the visitors one's not very hungry either. Just slowly do the Kangaroos everywhere. Very sleepy. There is a wildlife hospital here and they do operate on wildlife animals and birds and there is a viewing platform. We get to see that. They do operate 
on animals here. This is a wildlife, wildlife hospital and surgery room. Patient currently in care. So we started treating her. The doctors are studying some X-ray plates and they're showcasing how they operate on the animals. Exiting, I just noticed that there are some skeleton skulls of all these extraordinary animals. Look at how Tasmanian devil skulls look like. And this is Umber skull and this is Echidna skull. Beautiful, isn't it? This is the spotted coal that we saw. This is spotted coal skull. If you're visiting Hobart, you should come and visit Bonorong Sanctuary because it's only supported by these visits, the visitors' ticket entry fees, and that's the only source of funding they have. And so it's an important mission they're having here. And it's a fantastic spot. It's a beautiful spot where they preserve and conserve extinct animals. Australia has the highest number of extraordinary animals and birds and different species that you never find anywhere else in the world. But also equally it's important to know that Australia has the highest number of extinct species. So basically conservation of these extraordinary special animals and species are very important. So Bonorong Conservation Centre, this wildlife sanctuary, is doing a marvellous job preserving some of the native Australian animals and birds and species and uh, protecting them for the future generation. Anyone wants to come and have a hug of a wombat, I reckon you guys would. Do you want to come over? Free hug of Not wombat. Right so a Not a live wombat though. Look at this wombat. Do you want to pet the wombat? So unbelievable. She's not going to bite you, she's perfectly stuffed. <laughs> so we're, we're doing what we bite you. I know, she's not a real one, but she likes hugs. <laughs> Please listen to this section of the video where you learn more about Umbat and uh, the poo of Umbat which is a square shaped. It's been five long years of fundraising to get that vet clinic that you guys can go and visit now up and running. Uh, initially we had some assistance by an organisation called I4, International Fund for Animal Welfare. They paid for our vet clinic salary for three years which is amazing. So that kind of helped us out over the COVID period. Unfortunately, funding doesn't really happen much anymore. So, to be completely honest, you are our funding. So, all those beautiful smiling faces looking at me, you are paying for what we do, mostly behind the scenes. So, all those animals that we're rehabilitating, everything that goes on in the vet clinic, etc. So, I'm very grateful. If you're interested, you can go on the viewing platform and you can see things happening, which is kind of cool. But just be warned, you can see things happening, which can include operations and things like that. So. Now, um, Maisie will be being released into the wild. She's going to go from this, which is something gorgeous, cuddly, snuggly, still being bottle fed three times a day, to something mean, nasty and horrible. Mm. In the wild, they start to bite, charge, attack their mum to drive their mum away from home. They very much think of us as mum, so they start to bite, charge and attack us as well. Which sounds a bit horrible, but it's actually what we really want. We want them to be mean, because once they go mean, they don't go nice again. So we know that she's going to do perfectly well out in the wild, aren't you little gorgeous one? Because she's not going to want to know us at all. So all the humanising counts for nothing. And then what we do to release them, our sanctuary manager's parents have a 105 acre property. They've built a special enclosure for wombats. They'll provide food, water and shelter. Um, after about three weeks, they'll open the gate, wombats come and go as they like, and then they just don't come back, which is kind of cool, isn't it? So they tell us when they're ready to go by trying to kill us, and then they self-release as well. She's a bit sleepy. Uh, this time of the day is very much sleeping time for wombats, because they're nocturnal. If you go to the mainland, you do see bear-nosed wombats, you also see hairy-nosed, 
southern and northern hairy nose wombat. But you don't see them in very, very hot places because wombats don't like the heat. And that's why they're nocturnal. And that's why, hello, what you doing with me? And that's why they live in burrows underground. So the whole reason why they get mean, the hormones kick in, but they, the reason why they want to get mean is they want to attack mum and drive mum out of home. Mum spends a good two to three years digging the most advanced, sophisticated wombat burrow. It's going to be, we got any Americans? Okay, so it's 30 metres long, so about 90 foot long. And it's going to have different entrances, so it can be two, three metres deep, so about 12, 16 foot deep. It's going to go in and out and round about. And the young wombat goes, mm, I could do that, or I could attack mum, drive mum out, and inherit the family real estate while mum is still alive. <laughs> it's a little bit mean for mum. Mum will just go and start all over again. Hello. Mm. She's very sweet. So she'll have to make her own. So, um, so initially, at that soft release site, there'll be a half a burrow built. And then she'll come and go as she likes, and then she'll start to build her own burrow, because she doesn't have a mum anymore. And then she'll just move into that burrow. Now, herbivore, grass, leaves, roots and trees, two front teeth grow their whole life. So they need to eat hard things to grind those teeth down. It's a bit like a beaver, or for the rest of us who are not Americans, rats and things like that. So we need to eat roots to grind the teeth down. Anyone know something about a wombat's bottom that's a little bit surprising? It's square, right? Oh, the square poo. That's what you're thinking of. So I'd love it if their bum hole was square, but it's not the case. But they do, they are the only animal in the whole world that do little cube shaped poo. And I'll show you in a minute. And they do that to mark their territory. They don't want to be around other wombats. So they'll do a big pile of steaming fresh wombat poo on a big flat surface, like a rock or a walking board. And then because it's square, it doesn't roll away. But the how that it becomes square is not as exciting as having a square bum hole. Uh, they've got a high fibre diet. It takes them two weeks to digest their food. Some of the walls of the intestines are more elastic than others. Kind of squeezes in, squeezes out, comes out cube shape. I must admit, the other day I had a cruise ship night tour. I had 163 guests, which was quite a lot. We did have more guides than just me. But, sorry, but they were Americans. And I did tell them that wombats do round poo and then they get their little paws and they pat it into shape. <laughs> they didn't believe me for long, but for the split second that they did, it was fun on my behalf. <laughs> now, wombats, do you reckon fast or slow? Fast. Oh, who said fast? Yeah, you'd think they'd be slow, wouldn't you? Because they're kind of little chunky little creatures. But they can go 26 miles an hour, so 40, mi 40 k's an hour, which is quite quick. About the same as you say, bolt. But only for a short distance, because then they get too hot. And then they can't, um, they can't cool down. Hello, gorgeous. The other thing about their bottoms, which I find absolutely amazing, is actually really hard. They've got this area in their bottom, it's called fascia and that is their defence mechanism. So if a wombat's been chased by a predator, they're going to run to the burrow, stick their nose in, arch their back, leave their little furry bottles out. Anything attacking, not going to get life-threatening injuries for the wombat. The predator doesn't go away. Wombat sticks their head, sorry, flattens their body out. Predator sticks their head over the back of the wombat. Then they'll use their bottom like a battery ram crush the skull of what's chasing them between their bottom and the ceiling of the burrow. About a year ago, they found a Tasmanian devil with a crushed skull in a wombat burrow, which is awesome for the wombat, not too good for the devil though. Now I'm gonna tip her out very gently. She's very new to this enclosure. She's only been in here a week, so she's not that brave yet. But it's a good little exercise while I'm still here give us some little running around time. And you're gonna to get to see more of a wombat that way. You're gonna come out. Come on. She goes, don't tip me out. I don't think she wants to come out at all. What are you going for, Maisie? Do you wanna come out? Come on, Ned. You're gonna come down, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. Wombats 
pouch faces backwards because otherwise when they're digging their joey would get a face full of dirt so i've got something rather cool to show you one is one is a photo of a wombat it's looking at the rear end of a wombat with a little joey with its head at the back of the pouch or cube shaped poop She'll probably go straight back to bed because it's all a bit frightening at the moment. So that is looking at the rear end of a wombat and that's cube shaped poo. What I didn't tell you is they, they're born the size of a jelly bean. So they're very tiny. They're obviously a marsupial. All oh, baby marsupial. Tastes like fudge? No. <laughs> I never get any takers. That one's, that one's my left, so that one's Phoenix, that one is Callie. Good question. So they are both four years of age. They don't look like they're the same age, do they? Because Phoenix is a lot smaller than, than Callie. And the only reason why Phoenix is smaller is her mum was killed on the road when she was very tiny. We had to hand raise her. Used a, an amazing artificial product, but it's not as good as mum's milk. Callie, on my, that side, um, her mum had a horrible disease called devil facial tumour disease. Um, so, devil facial tumour disease, horrible disease, we've lost 68% of devils to it since it was first discovered in 1996. There is no cure, there is no vaccine. And it's transferred, which is weak, it's a cancer that it's transferable. Um, it's through contact with like blood and saliva. Um, good news is though, they were down to 10,000. Numbers are increasing. So the Save the Tasmanian Devil program, they've been working their way around Tasmania. So a couple of questions for you guys. Do you think they're a herbivore, a carnivore, or an omnivore? Which is... Carnivore! Yes! That was a good loud voice and you are absolutely correct. Nice job. So they're a pure carnivore. Do you reckon they're a scavenger, a hunter, or both? Uh, scavenger. Scavenger. Now, I can see why you think that they like to hunt as well, but they're not actually very good at hunting. And that is, they're not a very fast animal. So if, if their things that they're trying to eat runs away, they can't catch them. Um, but they can kill. So they prefer to eat dead things. They're actually slower than a chicken, believe it or not. <laughs> the reason for that is head is disproportionately large for their body oh, and their front yeah. legs are longer than their back I'm legs. Back so they're just not made for speed. Yeah. Also, yeah. eyesight yeah. terrible. Yeah. Only in black and white and only about a metre or two ahead. But if something old, sick and dying went past a devil, they would definitely leap out, kill it and eat it. So they're an animal that can kill, but not an animal that can hunt which is kind of sounds like a contradiction, but I hope you guys understand what I mean by that now. The perfect little scavenger, they can smell food from two kilometers away. So 1.2 miles away, which is pretty impressive. They've got the equivalent jaw strength of a hyena. So the strongest jaw strength of any animal for their size in the whole world. They can crunch through any bone in the human body except the femur. You know that big one in your leg? So anything else, they make very, very short work of it. They just crunch through. They literally eat everything. Flesh, fur, bones, the whole lot. Yeah, it's a little bit, um, a little bit confronting. They actually even like things when they're rotting and disgusting. So they don't care, they don't, it doesn't have to be fresh. They've got such a fast digestion that they can eat things that are really lean and stuffy and they don't get sick from it. Yeah. What else did you say? The smell. Oh, didn't you know? Um, people say they smell. I think they've kind of got an earthy kind of smell. I don't, but I, I'm a bit of a weird person because I love all wildlife, but I don't think they smell that mean. But they do have an amazing sense of smell. So, yes, so it's more to do with their noise and another couple of things. Can you see how red her ears are? When devils get excited, if they think there's food around, all the blood rushes to their ears. And they don't have much flesh or fur on those ears. Early settlers thought those ears looked like devil horns. So if you are an early settler and you're a tiny bit superstitious, 
and you are sitting around the campfire at night and all you can see in the dark are glowing red eyes, devil horned ears, and this is the noise you hear. So <laughs> That is only two devils. Two devils. So that's terrifying. So naturally they thought they were haunted by devils. But if you saw one in the wild, even though they're the largest carnivorous marsupial in the world, they're incredibly shy animals. Here at Bonorong, they are not shy. Uh, they're very territorial. I mean, they are in the wild as well, but for here, with us, they go, okay, this is my space. They've all got their own little quirks and personality. Callie is very cruisy until you go near her pond. As soon as you go near her pond, it's like, no, get away from my pond. <laughs> Phoenix, she's very cruisy and she, she's okay when you're in there cleaning, even the, the pond. But it, when you try and leave, she tries to hang off the back of your pants. Um, hence, when I'm working with devils, I don't wear tight pants because otherwise the teeth go straight into the leg rather than hanging on the end of the pants. But most of the time, devils are, I think, completely misunderstood. I think they're rather gorgeous little animals. I'm slightly biased, probably, though. All devils' markings are different. You know how they've got the flashes of white on their chest and face and the tail? It's going to be individual to them, so you're never going to see two devils that look the same as each other. Have I spoken about mating? I don't think I have. This is a bit of a gruesome stuff. The fun stuff is, they can eat 40% of their body weight in 30 minutes, which is pretty impressive. Store excess fat at the base of the tail. Now this is important for the little girlies, because when they're getting all hormonal, it's called going into estrus, that fat store moves from the base of the tail up to the back of the collar. The males will grab the females by that fat collar, drag them into the den, guard them for up to 10 days, won't let them eat, sleep, drink, or do anything while they mate with them as much as they possibly can. So the girls need that fat store for energy for the 10 days, but also as protection from the jaws, because equivalent jaw strength of a hyena. So that's, that's what all that's about, which is not much fun. But if the girls get pregnant, they're only pregnant 18 to 21 days. Super, super short. Does anyone know how many they give birth to? No. Three. Three is is kind of close to how many that yeah, can survive. They've got four teats, so only four survive. But initially, wait for this. They give birth to thirty to forty joeys all at once. Thirty to forty. Yeah, it's insane. So mum's pouch faces backwards, not because they're a digger like a wombat, because they are born the size of a grain of rice too far to go up and into a pouch. So the cloaca, where they're born, is only an inch from the pouch entry. So they just crawl up this thin mucus trail and try and make it into the pouch. And it's the first four that are the strongest. Um, they get there first. They're the only ones that survive. Mum will help them though. She goes, oh, I'll help you into the pouch, lick, lick, lick. But she kind of accidentally eats most of them. Yeah, so four survive and mum eats 36. Delicious. Anyone heard of hibernation? Yeah, yeah. Um, so hibernate, you kind of go to sleep for the whole winter. Torpor, similar. But it's only for three or four weeks at a time. So in winter, it can them slow their heart rate down to about five to 10 beats per minute. Their body temperature to almost zero. Dig underground, stay there for about three weeks, pop up, have a snack and go back down again. So the last time we saw Luigi was three weeks ago. So now he's coming out. Now if you guys are lucky enough to see their tongues from where you are, those tongues are 15 centimetres, so six inches long, and they go in and out a hundred times a minute. What he's eating is a delicious concoction of ant stew. So they literally eat ants and termites and lambs and grubs. A company makes a product, we just mix it with water and we give it to the keepers and they just love it. One of my favourite things to do in the whole world is to do this. Have a head, have a little kitten. They like having a hairbrush. 
Their spines are made of keratin like your fingernails, so it's a modified hair. They're actually not as spiky as what you think they're gonna be. <laughs> Except if they want to defend themselves. So if an echidna is frightened, they're gonna ball themselves up, turn their little spikies out, or they're gonna dig underground. Uh, if you've seen the echidna on the mainland, and you know, these are the only animals in Australia that are everywhere. Absolutely every spot in Australia. They don't care if it's hot, cold, they are absolutely everywhere. And they've been around for millions of years. They're little prehistoric animals and I just think they're adorable. But echidnas on the mainland, they have less fur than ours. I had a, an embarrassing moment not that long ago. I was in Northern Territory and I was at a wildlife park, because that's what you do when you're on, your, on your days off when you're a wildlife keeper, you go and see more wildlife. And I said to one of the keepers, oh, where's your echidnas? I really want to see your echidnas. And he goes, they're in the nocturnal house. What are they doing in their nocturnal house? They went, well, they're nocturnal. But our echidnas are not. So our echidnas are out and about during the day. I didn't even know, I felt so silly. But echidnas on the mainland, they're more likely to be out at night than during the day. Pretty cute. Best baby name of any animal in the whole world. Does anyone know? Their babies are called a puggle. A puggle? puggle. It's adorable. Anyone know who the cousin of the echidna is? Don't tell me, um, I just said it. <laughs> I was going to say, don't tell me porcupine, but it's a platypus. You can tell me platypus, because that's right. Yeah, so they're a monotreme, an egg-laying mammal. Yeah, which is a weird concept. Does anyone else think that's weird? I think it's weird. Egg-laying mammal. What are you doing, Luigi? Having a bit of a scratch? His little back claws face backwards. So they all do, not just Luigi. Um, because that helps them dig down faster. Because if they're frightened, they want to dig down super fast. Now, mating. Not quite as cute as what an echidna looks. So the males come out of torpor early in the females. Go and try and find a female, dig her up and mate with her while she's cold. Which is a bit brutal. But if she doesn't get dug up, she's going to go on a hike. And that can be six miles, about 10 k's. And as she goes along, She's going to admit pheromones and smell divine. And as she goes along, a little boy will follow her and then another boy will follow him until you end up with one girl followed by up to eight to ten boys all on a little, little line. It's called an echidna train. And at that stage, she doesn't have a pouch. She'll check all the boys out. She'll generally pick the last one standing. And if she decides to mate, that's um, on her terms at that stage, she then uses her tummy muscles to pull a flapper skin over to form a fake pouch, like a temporary pouch, and that's where the egg goes. Kind of fabulous. Don't have a teeth. You know, everything, all marsupials have teeth. They have milk patches that kind of ooze milk. Aren't they adorable? Quintessential little Australians they are. They're very laid back, groovy little creatures. So these guys are quite happy to share a plate. They're not gonna snuggle up together though. Um, and if they meet each other, they're not gonna fight for territory, but they're not gonna rush over to say hello. So they're kind of in between wombats, which are solitary, and kangaroos, which are um, more group orientated. Group of kangaroos is called a... a you know it. It's a what? Pride? Ah, oh, that's lion. Oh, Close though. It's a mob, it's a mob, mob of kangaroos. So if you go and feed our kangaroos, which you're more than welcome to do, you might get mobbed by a few. They are beautifully gentle. What you wanna do is look out for big square black boxes on the side of the enclosure. Big fistful of fur, uh, fur. where did that come from? Big fistful of food on, a, on your hand, hip high. And they like a pat on the chest and under the chin. Don't pat them on the head or the back because they don't really like it, it means go away. Um, but, Apart from that, does anyone have any echidna questions? Is the egg hatch in the pouch and then? Depends where you live. Okay. If you live in Tasmania, you put your egg in the in a burrow and then it hatches and then the puggle goes into the pouch. If you're on the mainland, you put your egg straight into the pouch okay. and it hatches in the pouch. Right? Yeah. So the first thing that happens, does anyone want to see a photo of a puggle? Yes. So the first thing that happens is that they are completely bald. And then they get their fur, and mum says, you can stay in my pouch. And then they get their spines, and mum says, get out of my pouch. 
Yeah. They've kind of got a bluey grey tinge to about them too. A heart speed to the city streets. We began to feel the fire. We rise like tall buildings as the chemicals they take us higher. The night's young and it's just begun as she puts her hand in mine.